the question sometimes arises, why was it that there were people in the Buddhist time who listened to Dharma talks and were able to gain stream entry? And the Buddha himself explains. He said they brought five qualities to their listening. One, they didn't despise the Dharma. Two, they didn't despise the speaker. Three, they didn't despise themselves. In other words, they were confident that listening to the Dharma, they could follow through with it. The next quality was that they would unify their minds around the topic. In other words, they listened with their whole, the whole mind. The mind wasn't scattered. The word for unification, egaka, is the same word that the Buddha would use for concentration in general. So you concentrate on the talk, and then you apply appropriate attention. Notice that's appropriate attention, not bare attention. The Buddha never talks about bare attention. There's always two kinds of attention, appropriate and inappropriate. Appropriate is when you take the lesson and you ask yourself, how does this apply to the question of what is skillful and what is not skillful? And then you try to carry through. If it points out that something is unskillful, you try to abandon it. If it's skillful, you try to develop it. And this, with time, mutates into the Four Noble Truths. Here again, you have truths with duties. You're not passively watching. You realize there's something to do. Suffering is to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned. Its cessation is to be realized, and it's the path to that sensation is to be developed. You realize there are tasks to be done, and you follow through with them. That's appropriate response to appropriate attention. And so we think about gaining insight into the mind as we're meditating. Remember that it is an issue of appropriate attention combined with the singleness of mind that allows you to see. Because you're looking with a purpose. It's not simply to see things, witness things as they arise and fall away independent of you. You realize that you're implicated in what's going on right now, because you look at the factors leading to attention. The main factor is fabrication. The present moment is fabricated as something you put together in three ways, bodily, verbally, mentally. And that right there tells you you're not here just to watch the present moment. Because the nature of fabrication is that it has a purpose. You do something for the sake of something. You put things together. You breathe for the sake of something. You direct your thoughts and you evaluate for the sake of something. You apply different perceptions for the sake of something. Like right now, you're trying to get the mind into concentration. So you breathe in a way that will give rise to a comfortable way of breathing for the sake of getting the mind into concentration. And you use directed thought and evaluation, again, for the sake of getting the mind to be willing to settle down, giving it a good place to settle down, so it's happy to settle down. And then using whatever perceptions and focusing on whatever feelings will be conducive to the concentration. So it's not just watching the present moment. The question when you're meditating is, how should you fabricate the present moment in such a way so that you can see fabrications clearly? And the main issue of fabrication is establishing mindfulness and getting the mind into concentration. So there's an agenda. Because there's another dimension to those three kinds of fabrication. The Buddha says, in a, in a larger framework, bodily fabrication applies to any bodily action that will have an impact on future lives. Verbal fabrication, any verbal action. Mental fabrication, any mental action that will have impact on into the future. And so you realize that you're sitting and meditating. You're focusing on the germs of these things. Any bodily action has to begin with the breath. Any verbal action has to begin with directed thought and evaluation. Any mental action 
has to start with perceptions and feelings. So right there, you're watching the present moment, but you realize that what you choose to do, how you choose to shape the present moment, is going to have a long-term impact. This is why we establish mindfulness in the way we do. Again, it's done with a purpose. You're fabricating for the sake of getting the mind into concentration, and you use mindfulness, alertness, and ardency. Mindfulness is to remind yourself of what lessons you've learned from the past, and also to remind yourself of what actions you've done, because you're trying to figure out cause and effect. And if you forget what you did, then when an effect comes, you're not going to know where it came from. You have to be clear about what you're doing so you can remember. Then you're alert to what you're doing and the results that you're getting. And what makes these qualities special and what makes them wise is ardency. You want to really do this well. It's interesting that when the Buddha defines mindfulness, it's a neutral quality. Alertness is also neutral. But ardency always has to do with what's skillful. That's the wisdom element in those three qualities. And so you focus on the breath. You're alert to what the breath is doing. You're alert to how the mind is relating to it. You remember what you've done in the past that's helped you settle down. And you really try to do this well. When you do, you get the mind into concentration. That's what you're trying to fabricate so that you can see fabrications clearly. Because the best way to see metal factors is to engage in them. Remind yourself you're not just watching things arise and pass away. You're actually determining what you're going to do. And then you look at the results. Now as the mind settles in and gets really clear and still. That's when issues of insight come up. Of course, you have to have some insight to get the mind to settle down to begin with. But then as the mind gets into concentration, you develop more insight. Here again, it's not just a matter of watching things or accepting things as they are. You're looking at them from the point of view of how to gain dispassion so you can free yourselves from them. Because you're looking in terms of the Four Noble Truths. That's what appropriate attention is about. And one of those noble truths is the third noble truth. There is cessation of suffering. When you develop dispassion for craving and the things that lead up to craving. So fabrication is one of those things that leads up to craving. So how do you develop dispassion for it? The Buddha doesn't have a vipassana technique, but he does have a series of questions. How should I look at fabrications? How should they be regarded? How should they be let go? And he lays out a general plan. You look at how they're originated, what gives rise to them, how they pass away, what their allure is, why you would want to keep on fabricating those things, and then the drawbacks of those kind of fabrications. You're looking for the allure. It's going to be difficult because often it's something you're embarrassed about. I don't know how many people say, they get angry and they don't like their anger at all, but they keep on getting angry. And it's because their reasons for liking the anger are things that they're embarrassed about, so they hide them. One of the reasons we practice concentration is so we can look in the mind and look at the things we don't like to see in our minds. Because if you don't like to see them and you refuse to see them, there's nowhere you can let go of them. So it's a question of admitting what's there from the point of view of a mind that's well settled. And we can really see why you go for a particular unskillful mental state. Then it's a lot easier to admit the drawbacks and to develop this passion. And the drawbacks are that. That's the area in which you start applying those three perceptions of the fact that they're inconstant and they're stressful, not worthy of being called you or yours. Again, with a mind that 
you want to let go. You have an agenda. These are value judgments. Because you're looking again in terms of that Third Noble Truth. If it weren't for the Third Noble Truth, just telling yourself this is inconstant, stressful, not self, I've got to learn how to accept these things and just be okay with the fact that I can't find anything substantial in my life. That's a recipe for depression. And we're not doing this to get depressed. We're doing this to free the mind. And the freedom is not freedom from hope or freedom from satisfaction. The whole point is that we find the ultimate happiness, and that comes through dispassion. It's because we have conviction in the Four Noble Truths, and the third one in particular, that we're looking for reasons to let go. And that's when we find that what the Buddha said was true. There really is a deathless element that you can contact, you can touch inside. It is the highest happiness. So this is why it's important to remember we're not here to apply bare attention. Because there's no such thing as bare attention as far as the Buddha is concerned. We're here to develop appropriate attention, then apply it to looking at what's going on with the purpose of fulfilling the duties of the Four Noble Truths. Now nobody's imposing these duties on us. The Buddha himself didn't impose them on anybody. But he did point out, if you want to find the truest happiness, this is what you got to do. And so it's through our conviction in, in his awakening that we follow this path with a purpose. And we're clear about the purpose. The fact that we're clear about it is what allows us to let it go when we achieve it. Because it's the sort of thing that doesn't have to be held on to. It's there. Unlike other things in life, it doesn't have to be maintained. As John Lee once said, Nibbana is easy. Everything else is hard. Of course, getting to Nibbana is not easy. It requires a path that you fabricate. The answer to that question of how to fabricate the present moment so you can develop dispassion for the fabrications. It's through fabricating the path. That's the hard part. But when you arrive, it's easy. It's the ultimate ease. And keeping that ultimate ease in mind is an important part of appropriate attention. Looking at everything from the perspective of how do I engage with this in such a way that I can find freedom. That's the perspective you want to keep in mind. So it gives guidance to how you fabricate the present moment right now. So whether you're listening to a Dharma talk or just focusing on your own breath, Try to do it within the context of appropriate attention, and you'll know what to do.